Ladies and gentlemen, it's prototype episode 14, Reaching Ascension, because we have reached the tournament stage of Cosmonarchy Brood Wars life cycle, and now I guess it's time to talk about them, how the first tournament went, how the second tournament is faring so far, some thoughts on the scheduling and the general approach and how we're reaching a wider audience with this. And, you know, we've clearly got a couple of new faces and some of the old faces are playing more regularly and all that cool stuff, right? Uh, and so maybe talking a little bit about the focus for the project in the near future and sort of uh, if there's going to be any changes in direction and, and whatnot, as well as uh, maybe a little bit of a patch preview for the upcoming stuff that obviously dates the episode of Prototype a little bit. But I mean, it's all kind of dated because we only just now started Ascensions. So there's definitely going to be a lot of like immediate reactions to things. And uh, before I continue, I'll, I'll note my air conditioner fan is on in the background. So enjoy the background ambiance. It's not just my voice you're hearing, but... You know, that if I didn't say anything, you probably wouldn't have noticed. I just have a stickler for uh, details in that sense. So let's talk a little bit about Ascension and the tournaments. And by the way, we do have some nice uh, coffee questions later on in this episode. So if you want to ask questions to get answered on this podcast that is going to be fairly regular. I think I'll average one episode a week. Uh, obviously, it's been like sometimes I do a lot in one in very short order, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer for me to do them. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're getting into the, the weeds here at this point, so we can pretty confidently say, yeah, I can take time to record, you know, for an hour, hour and a half, or however long it takes to uh, go through all of the details and answer all of the questions. But if you want in on that, then obviously you got to hand us some, some cash money. And if you're already doing that, then... Obviously, you should just be asking the questions in the chat. So a shout out to Alexander and Hoop Thrower, uh, who recently joined the ranks of the uh, Coffee Chads, as they are known among our circle. So thanks, homies. Ascension number one in review. That is our initial topic here. And I think, generally speaking, this tournament went pretty well. I would actually hazard a guess and say particularly with how group A of Ascension number two has gone, where it was super long and there wasn't really a whole lot, like there was, you know, the the issue with like versions and something causing like a desync in one of the games that we didn't immediately respond to and try to triage and whatnot. I mean, we tried to triage it, but it was just, it was just jank. Um, actually, I think Ascension number one was probably ran a little bit better. Now, there's one critique I can immediately levy at it uh, beyond the fact that like people were still learning the format and weren't sure exactly how it worked and stuff. And that is at the end of the tournament, once we reached playoff stages, we actually had to just like do because we we were planning on ascension 2 being immediately afterwards like the very next week we had to do playoffs throughout the week instead of uh you know saving it for the weekend and you know i can't usually do sundays uh, i think i could have that week but i can't normally do sundays because i usually would do my work uh, my shift work on sundays at the very least as well as a couple other days throughout the week so we had to like plan around everybody's schedules and obviously the like the the answer was kind of in front of us the whole time. We'll get to it when we talk about tournament scheduling. But if we had just done playoffs the following Saturday, well, presumably everybody would have been able to make it because they were able to make their group stage to begin with. So I think that was probably the, the obvious move. And it just took us a little bit of time to figure that out because it's a lot more satisfying to settle in for playoffs throughout an entire day, right? Uh, if you have, you know all of the series happening in the same day. Like the one advantage to having the grand finals on a different day than the semifinals is that the players have time to review them, their uh, opponents and rest. And, and generally speaking, you know, not be super fatigued perhaps after maybe there was a very tense back and forth five game series or something. And it went down to the wire. Like I could imagine somebody being really tired at that point. Um, and there's also the, the problem of like, if you do semifinal number one, then you do semifinal number two and number two t goes long, then the expectation is that in very short order, number three or the grand finals rather would show up and you would just have to like deal with the fact that you were fatigued after just beating, you know, just qualifying if you're the second person to qualify. And that could just be down to scheduling or coin flip of like, oh yeah, this is the first series. You know, it's not something that is intended to give you an advantage, but it would clearly do that. Although I guess you could also maybe argue that if you can handle the endurance part of it, you are able to play like you're, you're just, you're already playing. So like, why stop now? Um, I know that that like different people are going to handle that differently. Right. Uh, however, I, I think we would at the very least have like a 10 to 15 minute break, uh, by request of the, uh, person who had played, uh, or, or just the, the users in general, right? Like maybe both of the players who reached the finals were, one of them is tired from just, you know, finishing a series and needs to take a second. And the other one is like, uh, you know, hanging out with, um, 
you know, they, they were just like not immediately ready to jump in perhaps or something like that. So like both players might have, uh, you know, at least a, some kind of time bef between scheduling just because they one of them just played and the other one had played earlier. But whatever the case may be, it makes sense, I think. So, you know, there's ways that we can tweak the format. Uh, if we do get like an extended break, like, uh, I mean, 15 minutes isn't really that long, but say we get an extended break like that, you know, we can use that opportunity to obviously take a break ourselves as the casters. You know, Mask and I have been doing all these games, uh, except for the semifinals, Shambler versus Nablime, I, I soloed. But uh, Mask actually stuck around for the entirety of like a 12-hour day, by the way, on Ascension number two. So yeah, again, we'll get to like how that one worked, went a little bit later in the episode. But like, you know, the, he's been a, cha a champion and a trooper. So pretty cool stuff to, to have him there. Obviously adds a lot of color and... Uh, just another perspective to the to the casting and I think is valuable. Uh, in fact, if we were to, like if we could somehow make it so that every single cast replay or or live or whatever uh, for tournaments or just casually like the Benno versus Alexander game that Mess casted recently, if we could both be the ones to cast uh, the entire, like everything going forward, I think it, it actually would be a significant improvement to the general feel of it. Like you get to make your individual casting a little bit more significant by you know, getting your points down and then giving way to like, think of your next point while you're also listening to your co-caster take over for a little bit. It just works a lot better. It's a lot better than solo casting. Uh, assuming you have like two people who are equally good at, you know, forming their thoughts and putting them into words. And then, you know, yeah, obviously in, in this particular case, Mesk isn't as familiar with the project as I am, but he still ha is familiar with RTS design and all this other stuff. There's a lot of reasons why I think it makes, uh, it's valuable, you know, to have him on the on the roster for the broadcast. So, I'm not also, I, I'm I'm not really beyond maybe adding another voice or ha having more people in the rotation. You know, if we get people who are you know, have reasonable uh, enough uh, audio setups, right? You know, Mask wouldn't say his uh, setup is reasonable, but he's very clearly understandable. Uh, if if we get people like that who also are interested in doing the casting uh, for some of these matches, you know, I wouldn't be against doing that uh, and, and having a, another rotation there for the days where Mesk isn't available. Or maybe we just do a tri-cast as, as they are famed. And that is three. So, you know, there's a couple of things there that's like related to the broadcast side of things that is interesting. And I think we could do, you know, you know interesting things. I'm still not sure about the chat on the screen, um, but I haven't received complaints about it yet. It's just something that like personally, I don't know if it works. Like it, it definitely, the only reason it could work is because we have a smaller chat uh, pool and you know, like if this was a, a tournament that had like, you know, 500 viewers or something live or some even 100 viewers live, I don't think that would work out very well because it would just be distracting uh, to see all the messages keep popping up and stuff. Whereas um, like it also would kind of defeat the purpose. Like right now you can see the chats and like the main reason why they're on the screen is so that, you know, Restream, when Restream sends you like messages or whatever, like if you're not actually interested in typing yourself, you can full screen the stream and just not type. Or you can full screen the stream, and then if you have a second monitor, you can pop the chat out onto your other monitor, and then like you, that way you can still chat while doing that. And I guess on Twitch, you can just do like the theater mode or whatever, where it makes the screen relatively big and then keeps the chat on the side. So uh, anyway, what I'm getting at for that stuff is like it, to me, I think it makes sense for the vibe of this of the stream as it currently is to have the chat like it's okay. I, I, I think you could take it or leave it, but the bigger the tournament sort of broadcast gets like if that is something that that's a good problem to have that we, if we have like a lot of people chatting it might mean that we need to remove it from the stream so it's not taking up so much focus um because obviously it wouldn't change in size but like the there's a little bit of an animation of like the chat messages arriving and stuff and um yeah so anyway all that to say I think there's some interesting moves to be made uh on the broadcast i'm sure we can improve the ui and stuff i actually built out the ui for playoffs and then uh, was able to update it and, and all that. Sometimes live on the fly. Uh, sometimes I would actually do it correctly ahead of time. And uh, yeah, it was a little silly. But, you know, we're, we're still updating all that stuff. And I'm glad that we didn't try to wait until like the perfect storm of like everything was perfect. But Ascension number one still went out with like no technical issues. There were, there were no desyncs. There were no like instabilities or crashes. Um, there was a point where in... One of the games between Benno and Nablime on Main Street, we saw some rally like bugs and some like 
uh, strange issues. I thought there was actually a map-based imbalance where there was an asymmetry in the top right with the bottom left that made it so that you couldn't land your treasury there and build a quarry, but that's actually not the case. You can do it. It's just that also if you don't set the rally point, they can get stuck, so there needed to be some kind of change there anyway. Uh, as far as I know, that change still has not happened, but uh, that's something that like will wrangle uh, going into Ascension 3 at the very least, because the another thing that I feel really strongly about, and maybe there's some pushback on this, but as long as, you know, there's nothing critical, like in Ascension 2 and Group A, we had this problem where, like, diadems didn't receive, like, there was, like, some bug with them where they were still attacking ear units, and I didn't intend for that. Um, so that was definitely super scuffed. And I did change that because I thought that was really stupid to have the tournament, like, have such an impactful bug be affecting such an impactful unit, where it would basically affect all games that went a certain length that had Terran in them. And there's a lot of Terrans right now. So it makes a lot of sense where that would be the case. Anyway, the reason I'm getting after all of this and talking a little bit about it is... Uh, Generally speaking, my approach is as long as there's like if the change impacts gameplay and it isn't something like that diadem edge case where it's just like such a huge change that should have been made. Like another example would be there was a I meant to increase the gas cost of the quarry going into Ascension number two and the quarry went from 25 to 50 gas, right? Conceptually, like in the patch notes, that's what it said. Same for the Larvosk actually, it went from uh, 25 to 50 as well and a little bit longer for the time cost from 22 to 30. And... I just never made those changes in the dat file. So we didn't actually have the data the updated in the game, but I didn't change that afterwards. I just removed them from the patch notes instead so that it, it wasn't causing as much confusion. And then I made them to the pre-release, which is now updated along with a whole host of other changes. And that's a case where it's like, okay, this isn't like a bug. This is just me being somewhat forgetful and not for, you know forgetting to test something or whatever, which is regrettable because I did intend for those changes to be made because I actually think that they're positive changes for the game. I just didn't, you know, for whatever reason, they don't make it into the game. Okay, well, that's not like a, a, a really, really significant bug like the Diadem case. So I'm just going to leave it as is, and we're going to play out the rest of the tournament with that sh being still the case. And, you know, because that actually affects the gameplay. Like, if there's a crash, okay, I'm obviously going to fix that. If there's, you know, a really annoying debug message that also was fixed in uh, the same patch, the hotfix that I did for the Diadem, where uh, there was an invalid shield overlay that thankfully DF was able to um, patch over so that it doesn't uh, crash the game anymore. Like, holy moly, what, how embarrassing that would have been for it to crash. <laughs> but uh, glad that it didn't. You know, that's really grateful. Really grateful for that guy. Really grateful for DF in general, by the way. Like, just shout out DF at this point in the podcast, Darken Fantasies. He's a real man. He's been doing a lot of heavy lifting recently, not just with adding feet to the diadem, which is obviously phenomenal, but also a big deal is the idea of uh, the fact that he's been able to do so many programming related tasks recently to like, you know, catch some errors or fix some things. And he's been helping me out quite a bit. He's also at that point where he's actually testing the selection extender boys selection extender. Hello. But yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about all the, the previews and the, and the, the next moves later on. I'm a little bit uh, all over the place right now. Scattershot with my approach to the topic list here, but you know, Ascension number one, Ascension number two, I think at this point, you know, you can see the format, you can see the idea. Competitive integrity is, even if there's an error in the map, like if there's a live game, i.e. it doesn't desync and et cetera, then like, okay, well, whatever happens probably needs to stay. Like the diadem case is really extreme uh, where like some, like my testing didn't show that it was gonna happen. And you know, we were able to fix it and all that um, relatively easily. So it didn't take very long at all. That's never going to happen again, pretty much. And I think a large portion of the reason why that even happened to begin with is probably down to the tournament scheduling anyway. But like, again, separate point. It's just aside from that, I'm never going to find a, a bug or an imbalance or, and say, yeah, let's hot fix this, assuming it affects gameplay. Like if it's, oh, this map has a stupid spot in it. Yeah, I'm also probably not going to change that. We're going to play on the old version of the map. And we're going to keep that version going until playoffs are concluded so that everybody's playing in this even even battleground. You know, my, my heart does go out to Three Crow and Benno who had to play with diadems and uh, attacking air units. But, you know, uh, at the very least, they were they only had to play one game for it. And it was also stupid for other reasons that I don't think were too related to that. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, Ascension 2 definitely was a little bit more scuffed to start. We had a much longer group. Uh, DF topped it, only dropping a single game to Benno. And Three Crow had some interesting strategies and honestly was kind of close to clinching it out for playoffs, but didn't end up happening. 
Uh, another thing that could certainly improve is my ability to count the fucking game scores. Uh, I, I think because I, this is still new for me as far as running this kind of tournament, there were a couple of times, particularly towards the tail end, like I distinctly remember thinking that Mist still had to play because I counted him as three wins, but he actually had four wins. And I, I'm thankfully he recognized he had four wins and challenged me on it because otherwise I would have been like, what do you mean? No, you only have three wins. It says it right here on my overlay. <laughs> but that was just wrong. So yeah, like stuff like that, I think just won't happen in the future. I mean, another significant part of that is because we had to go back between, you know, versions and et cetera. We went to Ascension 2 Group A, Ascension 1 Grand Finals, Ascension 2 Group B. And, you know, that just is confusing. Um, and obviously it was like a lot of streams to run, uh, especially considering I was doing like a patch preview for a couple hours or an hour and a half or something before we even went live with group A. So like there was a lot, I was on broadcast for over 12 hours. I think it was like close to 13 and a half or 14 hours or something. And you don't make your best decisions, you know, 13, 14 hours into a, into a, a task. <laughs> you don't, you're not on, you're not fully switched on. I don't think I didn't, I didn't like significantly caffeinate or anything like that. I was, you know, being pretty low key about stuff like that. So Suffice it to say, I was definitely lacking in that department and definitely could have done better. Uh, but, uh, you know, you live and you learn, right? And so Ascension 3 will be much better. And I think Ascension 2 playoffs will be really good, too, because as I mentioned, we're talking about tournament scheduling now. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense to do these every other week instead of every week. It gives a lot more room for, you know, sat each Saturday, it's like, you know, alternating Saturdays, right? So the first Saturday is going to be group stage. Second Saturday is going to be playoffs. And then obviously third is like one and, you know, or, or third is like first and fourth is like second. So it's, you know, group stage playoffs, group stage playoffs. That's how we do it. And we just run that and see how, you know, if we don't get enough people one week for at least two groups, then we wait. Uh, and so, like, maybe we delay that by another week, and that gives us opportunity. And maybe we just, like, group up for some uh, general fraudarchies instead, uh, and, and, like, we sort of regress to that point. You know, for, for whatever reason, maybe people's schedules don't work. But honestly, I think, you know, we are having, like, we're, we're pretty, we seem pretty good at, like, after playoffs, we open signups and announce the third, the next tournament, right? So, like, after Ascension 2 playoffs end, we will talk about Ascension 3 and how it's going to happen. Uh, you know, our, you, this is our normal time slot is like the afternoon group is 3 p.m. and the evening group is 9 p.m. And these are Eastern times. And you can kind of like organize from there. And if we get the opportunity to have more groups, like maybe we can slot a group in at 6 p.m. And, you know, like that could be the third group or something. And like, who knows what exactly could happen? But like, these are interesting ideas or things to do. It's just like. I, I don't know. I think of that and I think to myself, like, there's definitely room for this to happen every other week. Uh, there's even room for it to happen technically every week. It's just, the, you know, there's for other reasons, there's not necessarily a great move. Like if we could guarantee people's availability for Saturday and Sunday, in, my, myself included, obviously, we could conceivably do, you know, playoffs on day one, Saturday, and then, uh, or sorry, uh, group stage play uh, are on Saturday and then playoffs are played on Sunday and championship Sunday and all that shit. And that could be technically like that could be conceivably fine. It's just, I wouldn't want to run everybody else ragged and I'm pretty sure I would run myself ragged too. So it's probably better to do this. Like, you know, that way also, if, if you do succeed in the group stage, cause the group stage will be on a new patch. The idea is, Oh, you get to, you know, the playoffs are played um, like a week later. So you have time to grind out like practice and stuff. And it gives you a lot of time to prepare for that. I think that's not something you need like, it's not a requirement for a good tournament. In fact, I would usually say that, like, you want to keep the meta within a tournament, like, relatively consistent. Not in terms of game balance changes. We already went over that. But in the idea of, here's my, um, like, the tournament meta between players. Like, oh, we played in the group stage, and we kind of know how we play. Or, like, I saw you play in the group stage, and I kind of know how you play. So here's how I think you're going to match up to me and all that stuff. Like, maybe that's better if it's, you know, over a short period of time. So you don't really get that insane level of adaptability. Uh, it, it's not necessarily possible. And of course, people have schedules. It's not like they're only playing. So they work their jobs or they do their stuff at home or whatever. And they're not going to just be able to be like, oh yeah, let me just take a whole week to grind and practice for, you know, this tournament that, you know, like it's not really going to happen necessarily. So anyway, all that to, uh, said, I think the scheduling will make a lot more sense when it's, you know, too... Uh, you know, every other week, right? So a bi-weekly sort of event. And then, you know, every other Saturday is going to be playoffs. Uh, so yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense that way. And of course I am open to other suggestions, but that seems to be like the most sensible move. Some people say that they can't reach um, Saturday as well as they can reach Sunday or something like that. 
And that is unfortunate, but this is just sort of the setup that we have right now. You know, if we get massive amounts of attention and I get massive amounts of money on the coffee page, well, maybe based on that alone, you know, we'll be doing pretty hot as far as, uh, you know, we can like, I can take Sundays off basically is what I'm getting at, but that's not happening right now. And nor am I even asking for that necessarily. Like, obviously it'd be great, but for me, it's not something that I think is a huge issue. Like I can still make this work and it's still more than enough. Like it's super good. The fact that we have tournaments at all is really cool. Uh, and even at, even though the Ascension 2 group A was a bit scuffed, well, maybe not more than, maybe more than a bit scuffed. And even though we had to go to grand finals and then go to back to group B, like, yeah, okay. It's been imperfect, but it's still been so good to have tournament play. And like, there've been some really memorable games. Like I actually think the Boscovine matches Obviously, Shambler won both of these, but the matches that Bo uh, Shambler played versus Mystery Me on Boscovine, uh, he played two of them, one in the grand finals on the pre-release update that had like pen uh, hyper penetration for C Cyprians and stuff. And then on the current live patch for release, he played another match in group stage of, of group B. In both of those cases, I thought those matches were really cool, really interesting backs and forth. Uh, the fact that like Shambler was able to come up with his plan, I think he had lost to mystery meet earlier in the turn earlier in that group stage on the second game like the first game he, he's just like trying to set the pace he's got all these skither cores and stuff the second game he tech rushes and goes straight into uh you know back and and uses that to uh to deal with the fact that there's all these goliaths and clerics and stuff and like abuses the mobility uh of the or the lack of a, a mobility of, of the goliath cleric armada and just the fact that like you use you, you're able to see that adaptability it gets better when you re look at the other games that were played as well. But I think that those were like highlight games for me. I think uh, Niblime versus Mystery Meat on Equilibrium, Group A, way back in Ascension number one, was really cool. Um, I think that was Group A anyway, yeah. Uh, and, and that was really cool to me because you get this opportunity to have uh, Mystery Meat like was really at a huge tech deficit. If he hadn't broken Nablime, he was almost certainly going to get owned. And I think Nablime could have taken that game if he had built like a single apostle and kind of knew how to use it. He could have definitely like it was the margins were that thin. It's not that the apostle is super OP, although I'm sure some people might disagree with that or challenge that statement. It seems to me like they're in a much better spot than they used to be at the very least. But if, if he had used like a little his tech a little bit better, then he would have held on. And if he held on, he's back in the game. And I don't know if he takes that game. Uh, even if that does change, but it, you know, the fact that it was so on, on a razor's edge and I was so worried as well that like, and maybe this will still come to pass when we get better players and when our players get better in general, maybe it will come to pass that it, it's really, it's the best move to just turtle up tech up and then win that way. And you just can't break them. But to me, I was worried about that. And then I saw mystery me stay on tier one for so long, get such an advantage and then finish it and like actually be able to push through it but it also wasn't super easy like he had to really work for it despite the army advantage that he had in part because of the tech deficit he was at and that's like exactly what i wanted out of cosmonarchy brood war that's exactly what i wanted about like the tech is your expression of power in many ways you can choose to remain at tier one to get a better army in the short term but at some point you're gonna have to pivot and indeed we did see that like his contingency plan was to drop an atlas like i don't know five minutes after <laughs> the atlas for Nablime had already finished maybe it was like super long time and just like the fact that he was able to clutch that out or had a chance to, like, even if he doesn't and he, but he still had a chance, like that's still really cool to me either way. And so that game was definitely the highlight, I think so far of both tournaments, but uh, some of the matches that were happening between Shambler and Mystery Meat were definitely really good uh, as expected from the two, you know, top players of the tournament uh, of both tournaments, most likely. And then uh, I did think that it was kind of funny that, uh, I mean, DF was able to abuse Anthelians. Well, I say abuse, but he was using Anthelians. And it felt like Kian, Three Crow, he had a lot of choices to use against them. But, he, you know, maybe he was a little bit unfamiliar. And it's at, a, at a certain point when he had all the Valkyries and he wasn't, like, stationing a bunch of them um, uh, near his resource lines and he wasn't clearing all of the witnesses that were being used for targeting, like... I'm sure there's some UX thing we can do where the Anthelion reveals itself at its uh, look at the location it's moving towards. And I did hypothesize that we could have it so that while it's moving at it's warping towards a location, it's actually damageable in that location as well, which would probably on a technical level mean that you would create a unit at that location and then um, 
you'd create a unit at the location and then any damage it takes is reflected back onto the old unit and they have like the same HP and shield amounts when it's created. And so that, that way it's like a link basically. And that's how you would handle that. Uh, to me, I'm not 100% sure. Like I, I, I'm not sure exactly if that would just make them completely useless because obviously it's not like they can move normally. They have to move this way. So like, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe it would at the very least stop you from being able to use them on guarded expansions and guaranteeing some damage and disruption onto the mineral line because while you're warping there, you're going to get attacked by like watchdogs and stuff or whatever the case may be. I think that would probably allow, at least allow it to be a little bit more fair so that you need more of an investment than simply having vision and having the Anthelion. Um, and also so that you can, you know, you can do more interesting things that way in some ways anyway, where you can bait them into attacking the Anthelion and, and all of that stuff. But I, I think also they're a little bit clunky to use. So I wouldn't really want to nerf them into the ground or anything. And that's not the intent behind that, but certainly making the decisions for both players more interesting. And maybe also, you know, thinking about whether it's actually fair that you get to do what you can currently do. Um, I would have to be probably on the receiving end of it to make more evaluations. And I'm sure I could interview uh, some of the players that have been on the receiving end of, of Anthelians and ask them how they feel. Uh, I, I Lundy already mentioned actually, after playing some games against DF that uh, they are, uh, I think he called them like cunt units or something. So people are probably not too happy with them, but I mean, I think their power fantasy is really cool. We just need to make sure that it's not toxic, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and, you know, that just means fair, basically. It's like, if we make them fair, they, by definition, won't be toxic. So, yeah. Uh, or feel fair. I mean, feeling fair is, like, harder to quantify, but I think it's possible to do. So, anyway, I'm getting through all of that. Um, there's definitely been some highlight matches, and I definitely think the tournament scheduling will help us out quite a bit. So that is Ascension uh, in review, like the Ascension tournament so far. Obviously, second one is has entered playoff stage, which we will be conducting using the new tournament schedule around, uh, yeah, so Saturday, 3 p.m. for the first series, 5 p.m. for the second, and 7 p.m. for the grand finals, all times Eastern. And I feel like that should be pretty cool. It should be pretty good. So one of the other mega topics here is reaching a wider audience through the tournaments. They increase the stakes of the matches and they're more likely to get eyeballs on you when you think about it like, okay, there's a Brood War tournament, you know, there's gonna be some people that are interested in that. Now, a modded tournament is always a little bit more eyebrow raising because people usually only participate in tournaments or indeed things like mods and games only usually have tournaments when there's enough interest to support them to begin with, right? Like that's kind of what needs to happen first. And when people find out that there's a little bit of money on the line, maybe that is enough to, you know, pull the trigger on some people and have them be like, oh yeah, I'm definitely joining now. But even beyond that, it's like, these are a little bit of extra, you know, I guess guarantees that like, it's not a waste of time for you to put some time into even just watching this, let alone actually playing it. And as a result, you know, it's just gonna have more and more eyes on you, right? When we were in the middle of doing, uh, I think it was the match on repulsion between Mystery Meat and the Shambler in group B of Ascension 2, uh, Hawk, one of the amateur players from North America who is, you know, a top foreigner, you could say, like somebody who hangs around with, you know, Gypsy and Nyokin, uh, who maybe aren't like, I mean, Gypsy's pretty good, but Nyokin's, you know, some people would call him washed or whatever. I think he still plays to a pretty reasonable level. You know, like he's known and and uh, in the ranks and stuff of people like, you know, Artosis and et cetera adjacent to some of these personalities and players who are from the foreign scene, specifically in North America's region. And I feel like when you have somebody like that, check out your project. He was in the chat. He was like, oh, how do I play this shit? You know, like, <laughs> like what is this beautiful craziness or something? And how do I play it? So like, that's the kind of thing that makes you raise your eyebrow. You're like, okay, well, even amateur uh, pros are noticing it. Now that guy has, pl I've, I've shouted that guy out specifically on a few uh, occasions in the server, I think, and like just talking about stuff. He's a guy who even plays NHFFA, and that's where some of the crowd is. Like Nablime and uh, uh, Benno are from there. Uh, Greth and Alexander are from there. Greth recently joined the server as well. So that's the kind of thing where it's like interesting. You know, you get this crowd of people that are interested specifically because you've started to do this tournament stuff. Like, I wouldn't have even you know, rejoined the NHFFA Discord if it wasn't for knowing that, like, Benno and Nablime were in there and they came to our community from there, you know, or, or like, 
then I spread the word in there about the CMBW tournament, and that's what got Nablime interested. And then I popped in, and that's what got Alexander and Greth interested, and like finally got them to you know make the jump over or whatever, or or raised enough awareness to begin with. And that's like that's just a, a common example of like word of mouth or whatever. But I think it's interesting and neat and uh, definitely something that I want to pursue. But it also means that I want to take a little bit more of a focus on audiovisuals, right? Because we're now presenting this to a wider audience. And some of the things that we have, like the Phalanx revision and the Cyprian and Cyclops and, you know, some of these other units that were put together, like the Panoptus and the Vassal and the Aurora, like a lot of these units, the Ecclesiast, you know, the Legionnaire, they look you know, like at least you can identify them as, you know, being of the same caliber or uh, somewhat related to the uh, render style and the light style and stuff of, uh, you know, StarCraft 1 units. And then you get to stuff like uh, even the Madrigal, which, you know, is is reasonable. It's certainly, it's like better than what it used to be, uh, but it's not quite all the way there yet. Particularly you put it side by side with the new Phalanx from DF and it's very clear that like my work is a little bit, uh, lacking in that department and something that I could improve upon. And then there's all the other stuff that's like the Coras needs a new mesh so that it could even have the gameplay that I want it to have. And like all this other stuff that needs to be done. Um, you know, the Paladin looks pretty sick, but could probably use some material updates. Uh, we would need actual textures for it instead of the procedurally gen ones or whatever, but, uh, or not the procedurally gen ones, but the, the ones that are just like noise textures or whatever. Uh, clearly we need something a little bit more involved for that because it's very big. Otherwise it becomes kind of monotonous and uh, low detail, you could say. So that's some interesting stuff that we got to crack. And like, I'm going to be working, especially about the Zerg stuff. Like I have to work with Solstice when he's got availability and I've got availability and they kind of match up. Like we need to work on like getting the materials for those things down so I can finally start using some of the graphics that I've, uh, you know, been able to download and animate, you know, rig and animate and, uh, and all that. And I haven't done any sculpting or modeling for, uh, low poly or whatever you might call it, uh, you know, Zerg type organic units, but I'm starting to do a lot more modeling in general. Like I'm, I'm mastering or, or at least learning uh, box cutter and hard ops uh, in Blender, these paid add-ons that get, give you a lot more opportunity to do some hard surface modeling. And I'm sure a lot of them will even be useful for low poly organic modeling, considering we don't really need a crazy poly count for this sort of thing. Uh, and even if we did, I suppose we could just use like subdivision or something on a low poly thing if we needed something a little bit higher detail. And anyway, all of this is to say, like getting some more audio visuals, getting more reads, improving the particle system or like the, the roster of particle effects that we have. I've asked Iskatu Mask to send me some more particles recently and he has come in with the goods. Actually, it was some time ago now, maybe over a week ago now, but I finally have some time today, starting today to actually go through those, dig them out and start working on them. And that's certainly going to be a focus going into the next couple of dev streams and just in general, right? I, if I can improve the audio visuals, if I can update the textures and lighting on some of the meshes, if I can improve some of the animations, if I can, you know, create some new uh, graphics for some of the projectiles, like it shouldn't be too difficult for me to make some missiles and stuff uh, with what I know now. And I remember actually like a long, long time ago, I was even finding the idea of making a missile somewhat daunting in, in a modeling program. And now it's like, bro, that's like one of the easiest things you can make that in like 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes, get it gets you like a render, a full render that you can use. You can even give it custom, uh, you know, smoke effects and, and or uh, like a fire effects as a trail for a thruster and whatnot. And like, that's just like so crazy to think that I can do that now relatively easily uh, in such short order. If I want something for like unique to the Madrigal Furia missile, for example, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do something like that. So anyway, what I'm getting at here is definitely that we are, I, I'm appreciative of the fact that we are going to have some kick-ass graphics and some improvements in that department. I definitely want to add some more like unit responses and maybe like maybe see if we can actually do the banter system that I've always wanted where like it, this unit dies and specifically it was dealt fatal damage by a hierophant and it had, you know, max stacks of signify on it. So it was, you know, signified malice. And then you hear the hierophant like triumphantly laugh or something. And, and it's not, it's sort of like the Eidolon. Some people don't know this. When the Eidolon drops a, a you know, paints a target, he actually does say a line for everybody who, like everybody who happens to have vision on him and hears him will uh, like, you know, has their camera near that or whatever. He'll say, you know, you call down the thunder or, or he'll say now reap the whirlwind. One of those two, right? Um, so th like he has one of those lines that he, he drops there. And I think that's really cool as like an iconic moment, right? Um, another thing that I definitely need to do, uh, especially if we're going to go into like team games and stuff is 
this is not something that you would ever see in the live casts or the replay casts, but you know, it, replacing the advisors with something new, I think is another task that I'll be doing this week, just because we don't like the, oh, okay. The overmind advisor for the Zerg or whatever is probably fine, at least for now. Like I would like to replace him when we settle on some new lore for the, how the Zerg work. But, uh, the, uh, Obviously, the Protoss is totally scrap cobbled together. And the Terran is mostly okay, but uh, a little bit jank. And the exceptional one is when you have a Terran ally and they just say the T is under attack because I, <laughs> I, I couldn't find them ever saying Terran, you know, or even ally. So yeah, uh, it, that's like just, I couldn't find the, the thing. And like, I know some people would just be like, well, now you can use AI generated audio to like create new ones, but all of the results are so terrible in terms of sound quality. Maybe it would technically be a mark, like a notable or even slight improvement to have lower sound quality, but at least I'm saying something that's more intelligible. Uh, at the same time, I would much just rather have like a new adjutant voice that's, you know, unique to this project that helps to set the race apart uh, even further, right? And so I'll definitely be doing something like that for Proton. Uh, since they are the most scuffed, since their advisor doesn't even, like, their advisor is different than Alderis, so there is no, like, you know, the, 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 the way that it's edited and the way that it's intoned and stuff, it's completely different. So, anyhow, what I'm getting at here is we need some sort of improvement and we need some sort of, uh, you know, adjustments and stuff in a lot of audio visuals and, you know, for the player side. Uh, maybe another thing that we should probably figure out doing is improving the fact that the uh, like the notification system in general, you might want a bigger delay before you get allied transmissions. I think that makes sense. But uh, like, there's definitely going to be some things that get tweaked and improved. And another thing that definitely is important for me is um, when you like when we're trying to like say, hey, this is our project. Here's a presentation of our project, and like here's our players, and here's a tournament. Like you, you want as few audiovisual problems as possible. And the longer the game goes on, the more units you're going to see. And some of those are really epic, like the diadem. Uh, although even now, like the the liftoff sequence is, is low in frame count, and the shadows are really fucked up. And that's something that DF has said like he's going to address later on. So like for the demonstration video, I'm going to wait for that. Like I'm going to make a super weapon roster video, uh, and that's going to feature a bunch of things. Like I would rather have you know, a fixed version of the Diadem's graphics so that we don't have to worry about that as much. Uh, it These are not simple fixes. I mean, the animation is probably simple enough once he decides to, you know, he, he said himself, he's like, yeah, this isn't like my max effort, like work or whatever on the on the landing gear. It's just like something to, to have a placeholder basically. And that's fine. Like that's still improvement because it shows that the structure can lift off. So I'm not upset about that. Uh, but, it, you know, if we're going to make a video showcasing this, we would like to, you know, reach a wider audience with some of these showcase videos. That's another thing that led up to this tournament is that we had the didact unit profile and then we had the, you know, the feature pro, um, the featurette that explained the mechanic or the system of uh, having the, uh, what is it, quick targeting and stuff, right? So, like, having that feature is really good, uh, showing that off and, and whatnot. And... Uh, yeah, like just having that work, uh, having, I guess you could call them more marketing materials, but it's like, you know, I was thinking about this and, and CMBW has kind of had this similar player base and, and outreach for a long time before we started doing these uh, videos and the tournaments. And it's like, these are orthogonal to other work. Like you can either continue to work on the project or you can start marketing the project. Like, I mean, like you can spend your time doing like one of them doesn't necessarily, one hand doesn't necessarily wash the other in this instance, right? It's not like by building out a unit profile for the didact, I am like working on the project more. I'm, uh, you know, more of that, those efforts are actually gonna be put towards outreach and marketing and whatever you wanna call that uh, as, and spreading the word of mouth and all that stuff. And less of it is going to be towards actually developing the project. But at the same time, when I'm considering how I'm gonna present something, it does focus me super heavily on that one thing. And that might make me change some of the visuals or maybe update some stats and like, you know, the ranges of stuff. I don't think anything happened for d the didact, but I remember thinking like, well, I might take another look at the Sovereleth and obviously the diadem like changed massively since I was starting to, to script out and record the, uh, the super weapon profile. I wrote out the section on the diadem and as I was writing it, I wrote, be, you know, like the start of a paragraph was though the diadem cannot attack air units. And then I remembered, oh, it can, but it probably shouldn't be able to and stuff. And then, yeah, it just didn't end up like, like that's one of the cases where it just, it forces you to recontextualize and really think heavily about what you're presenting because you're focusing super narrowly on this one thing. And normally I take a very scattershot approach to that where I just, 
I implement a bunch of stuff and maybe I get it like 80% of the way to it, what its final form will look like, but then I kind of leave it there for a very long time before really finishing that last 20% or, or whatever the percentage values end up turning into. And I think that's given us a lot of breadth in terms of having so many options and like obviously there's a lot of units in there, but we've already identified at this point, not in this podcast, but just previously it, talking about the project, there's a lot of cases where like, you know, people, uh, Beaver was testing Madcap versus Maverick, and then Lundia started testing like Olympian versus Maverick and stuff. But like, there's like cases like that where the stats and imbalances or whatever are going to be there, and we need to balance them into late game more sanely. And we just haven't gotten the sample size yet to do that. But I also haven't focused on just like, okay, well, are there any things that I want to change about these units and the flow of like the tech tree and stuff without having needing to see sample size? Like, I just haven't focused super granularly on that and by doing this unit profile um or, or like the cornerstone features like if i do a, a, a feature on how reclamation works like yes i'm going to want improved visual audio visuals yes i'm going to want like better um overlays and etc for like how uh lazarus agent and, and reclamation in general works yes i'm going to want improved animations for the apostle and uh you know improved textures and render for the aeon and the antikathon I don't know, like it's a cool looking unit, I guess, but like maybe we want to make some more changes to it. And and all of that stuff is said. And I, I kind of look at that and I think like, yeah, I'm going to want all those audio visual changes and maybe that's going to slow up the actual unit profile or roster profile construction, like for the video. But at the very least I can focus on like, what does this make me want to change about the gameplay presentation? Like, is there something I want to change about that? And that is definitely going to um, require me to, you know, think a little bit more deeply about that. So... I think there's a lot of value in trying to do this marketing exercise because su surprisingly enough, it has forced me to think a little bit more deeply about the gameplay and as well as obviously the audiovisuals because it's forcing, it's like narrowing my focus onto the one thing or the couple of things that are the subject of the video. And that is really useful for, you know, basically just taking my uh, abilities, my skills, and obviously the fact that I have a host of other people like Solstice or DF or whoever who might contribute to the project or have been contributing to the project and might contribute to this one thing. And then I get to like just focus all of those resources, be they mine or my, or my compatriots on the one thing. And that's really cool and obviously beneficial for basically polishing up and finishing off something that was already at, like I said, like 75, 80% or whatever. And I think there's a lot of value in doing that. So Reaching a wider audience, having that audiovisual focus. Of course, this does translate into also like improving the balance and flow of the of the tech paths and stuff, uh, making sure that units provide different options. Like you know, the dilettante is probably really uh, you know weirdly balanced currently. Could probably be using some improvements. The other thing to think about is the. Um, you know, there's like a lot of options in general that like maybe overlap with each other. Uh, maybe some units are just not very useful right now in the late game or the mid game, and we just don't have the sample size to confirm that. And so I can take the time that I have. I have the, you know, this day and then two more days off after this. And just in general, when I have like stretches of days off, I can use that opportunity to focus in on like, okay, what's something that's really lacking right now or just kind of a black box and not thought of. And maybe I can even use the lens of if I was going to make a video presenting this unit or this couple of units or whatever, what would that look like? Like one of the ideas that I had was a roster profile that covers like everything out of one structure or maybe everything from one tier out of a structure, right? So it's like tier one Raider or bio, whatever you would call that uh, for Terran. Like that's that's the stockade with uh, the medbay out or the vestry out on now, uh, those five units. Just make a video going over those five units and talk about what they can do. Um, and, and then like kind of go through the whole game like that, right? Like this is something that we have. And, and this also does beg the question, are you going to focus on, you know, does this mean that there's never going to be a change to those unit rosters? Like, probably. Like, I think at this point, the stockade is finalized. I don't think I'm going to, you know, add a third add-on or change something about, like, you know, removing one unit and adding a different unit or something. Like, that's what the faction system is kind of for. But I feel like I'm pretty happy with the five units that you have available from the stockade at Tier 1 and also from the uh, Covenant as well. So, like, the Eidolon and the Savant, we just have to, like, maybe, maybe we'll make some changes to those units or something. But, you know that will come thoughts of those th thoughts related to the changes that might happen will come from the unit profile or the roster profile being made in the first place. And so like when I make a roster profile, I probably am saying this is kind of like the final form and I, technically I can go back on that. Technically I can go and update the didact after, you know, changing, making changes to it to begin with. Like one of the ideas we had was 
making stasis field uh, create a shield instead of making units completely untargetable. And the shield would have to be burned through in order to free your unit. So you could choose to attack your own unit for that. Uh, or you could choose to like stasis your own units to give them a shield. And then like maybe while they're like that, they're, you know, used as a wall or something. Uh, so like there, that would be like a little bit different, but there's like counterplay to it a little bit more directly than simply waiting. But adding you know, more shields without really making the UI look stupid is a little bit more challenging than it might seem. Uh, so uh, while as long as the shield is up, it would still be frozen. So I guess like technically we could probably do it. Just presenting it to the player would, would be a challenge because we can't just like create max shields on a unit um, using the same old UI. So we would have to like think about how to bypass that or something. Uh, we were going to try to have a display for that for defensive matrix as well for obvious reasons, right? Um, so yeah. At this point, though, I think we're in a pretty good spot for most of the Terran arsenal, especially from, like, Tier 1 through Tier 2. I think everything is... I'm happy with everything there. Uh, tier 3 is where things maybe get a little bit more dicey. Like, do I maybe change some of the Apothecary around, or do I change some, uh, some stuff like that? Um, but, you know, we have a long way to go before we have unit profiles for all of that. And I wouldn't want to just do all of Terran at once. I'd probably do, you know... Terran, Bio, and then at, at Tier 1, like, Stockade units. And then I'd probably do Zerg, Quasrock, you know, a showcase of those units. And, uh, again, just all at Tier 1 or whatever. And then, you know, who knows? Like, Protoss, we are going to be significantly updating them. And so I would want to finish that macro revision beforehand and, like, see how the AI handles it and stuff and uh, see what can be done about that uh, before I move any further. So, yeah, I think... You know, I'm thinking about all of this stuff and it feels like there's definitely a path to using the marketing materials, if you want to call them that, these sort of roster profiles and et cetera, as opportunities for us to successfully achieve a, just, just any sort of like word of mouth spread, but also to improve the actual objective quality of the project by finalizing certain details about units. Like it is basically forcing me to say it's over. Like this is the last thing I'm going to change about this one unit or something, at least significantly. Like I'm leaving room, wiggle room for like stat changes, but changing like, you know, certain things like, uh, the range of a unit's weapon or the HP it has or something. That's fine. That's within, you know, within spec changing like an ability, maybe not like replacing an ability with another ability. Not really. So I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to talk about as far as the CMBW side is concerned. Uh, obviously, I was hinting at maybe we would do a patch preview. The one thing I can say is I'm aware of a couple of issues, right? So I have these sorts of uh, ideas where I have this um, document here that I'm using to reflect as far as like things to assess. And one of them is the uh, resource costs of the IRL Iris and the Austal Lava form for Zerg uh, tech nodes. They are significantly more gas intensive than the uh, Atlas and the Daedala. However, I'm not sure if making the changes to bring them down to like 400, 800, and 800, 1600, uh, respectively, like, yeah, that is significantly less than the Daedala and the uh, Atlas. I'm not sure if the Daedala is going to get more expensive or not, by the way. Like, that could be something that I think about doing, uh, since it does feel like when you hit tier two, you can hit tier three a lot sooner, and maybe I should delay that by increasing the cost. Um, that, might, that might make sense. But I, say I only touch the Iral Iris cost for Zerg, I still think it's quite possible to tech rush in a lot of cases, and I haven't really seen any significant dis disparities between, you know, Terran and Zerg tech timing. So I'm not 100% sure that this is actually a problem, uh, especially since now in the new economy, minerals are not as less worthwhile or not as much of a surplus as they used to be relative to gas. Like now it's a little bit more even uh, because of the cost changes and the mining changes. However, I do think that the general pricing of mid to late game units relative to this new economy definitely is a little bit out of whack. This is stuff like the Gorgon previously costing 25 gas before this latest release. Like pff, that's not very much gas. Um, stuff like the quarry in the Larvos colony actually only costing 25 gas as well. Uh, another thing that like no longer is as much of a significant um, hamper as it used to be. Because uh, you just get the gas, the that you get those low amounts of gas a little bit faster, which I was worried would result in you being able to tech rush to a ridiculous degree. But it did have the prophesized effect so far of like, well, you can't actually hold on and play defensively versus somebody who's investing all of that gas into more powerful tier one units. Ergo, 
if you do try to be greedy in Tech Rush, you will probably end up getting punished because your units will be weaker and less numerous, and thus you will end up getting overwhelmed before the game really has a, a chance for you. It gives you a chance to actually drop your Atlas or your Iral Iris. So you do need to actually invest in, in more powerful units and stuff, uh, or maybe better infrastructure or something like that. So with all of that said, it's definitely something that I'm interested in exploring. The idea that, hey, you know, you've got gas that is a little bit easier to get. Uh, your minerals are thus not as extremely polarized to the point where you have like thousands of minerals and hundreds of gas. Uh, like it's a little bit more even killed most of the time, unless, you know, you just don't spend your money, I guess. But like assuming you're kept on top of your macro, you know, you can definitely... Um, still expend a lot of stuff in tier one. It's just as you scale up too much, like I think maybe the pricing of the mid to late game units needs to be a little bit more gas intensive, needs to require a little bit more gas because I don't know that you, um, like sometimes you'll just float a lot of gas and be able to still build a pretty significant army. And then other times, like maybe you have a lot of minerals and that's because you didn't build any captaincies or mantles or whatever as Terran, uh, or because you didn't build, you know, what, whatever the case may be, like maybe you never got a Quas rock and uh, maybe you just aren't spamming out Zerg units that cost only minerals and like maybe the, the Protoss stuff is just like good luck learning that to begin with because it's just so dense uh, and all of that stuff. These, there's a couple of other things like obviously I just talked about how the higher tier units probably need to be more distinct and significant or at the very least like, di you know, distinct is a big deal because they need to do something different than their, you know, lower tier counterparts. And the, ma the Madcap versus the Maverick does do that even if the numbers might be a little bit out of whack. Um, you know, I, I would still shy away from buffing up damage a lot because the lethality of things needs to be adjusted uh, to or needs to remain like medium right it, if the previous version of cmbw had you know re like fast time to kill and then se2 has like ridiculously high time to kill the new cmbw has medium time to kill which is a little bit slower than whatever brood war had so like brood war is somewhere in between old cmbw and new cmbw um and i like the current time to kill a lot for tier one i would hate for that to change as tier two and three go on when you're fighting with even tech like tier two versus tier two or whatever, or even like the upper echelon of tier one against tier two, like Goliaths are tier one, but they're like a 1.5, you know, right? They're a powerhouse, you know, I try to use that kind of terminology for them. Uh, same for like the Draconid in many ways, although maybe they scale off a little, they fall off a little bit faster than Goliaths do. And actually related to Goliaths, obviously we talked about Goliath Cleric and stuff in some of the Ascension matches. I think healing time and repair time probably should be adjusted ever so slightly. Uh, this is because, uh, this is actually something that Mesk pointed out at the end of, I think it was Group B of Ascension 2. But just in general, it's like the healing times didn't really get adjusted, but the... Uh, obviously the time to kill went down, or uh, went up rather, and uh, you know, the durability went up. And as a result, you get more value out of that like you, you, your damage time your time to damage went uh up like uh, how much time it takes you to deal the same amount of damage but the healing was never adjusted in, in sync with that so you know maybe like a 1.25x increase or something like that in in how long it takes to heal to full would at least be a subtle push in that direction and we'll see how that works because those numbers didn't really get it get looked at right um there's also a couple of other changes that i have written down here but they're they're pretty minor uh stuff like related to revising the fleeing uh, so that, um, you know, Lundier was pointing out that, like, fleeing is sometimes really stupid. Uh, I think it's better if you can attack, but, like, I don't know if you should never flee, because never fleeing also seems kind of weird. But, you know, maybe we could take the flee off and, and just have it so that they uh, they don't... Like, the battle reaction that we only need it might just be attacking a target that's nearby or attacks you, uh, as opposed to always fleeing. Like, maybe we do just leave flee off or something. I don't know. We'll think about that. Anyhow, uh, that's sort of the, a preview of some of the things I'm thinking about. It might not be for the very next update that you'll see some of these changes, but these are some thoughts that have been uh, put into my brain as a result of listening to Mesk's commentary and some of the players' commentaries on the game, but also watching the games and seeing the tournaments. And it's really cool to have that stuff uh, in the can, so to speak. So that's sort of where we're at as far as the uh, July uh, patch preview in the direction of July in general for CMBW as we get into that uh, halfway point of the month. Now we arrive at the coffee questions section. Sometimes I say Kofi because it's KO, but anyway, coffee. Uh, Co-fee.com forward slash Pronogo and Veek7. Link in the description. Actually, Veek got a job recently, but you know, every bit still helps. Same like me. I have a job and every bit still helps me. So if you like helping us, uh, you know where to go. And if you like asking us questions, you also know where to go. Up first, our newcomer Alexander 
has asked two questions, and then Mirian, our old comer, I, I don't know what you would say about that, our veteran, uh, he actually has requested that the other question uh, gets answered, because he was like saying, oh, you can answer one of these two questions, and then Mirian was like, oh, my question is, answer Alexander's question, so that was pretty funny. Uh, and of course, Luciferius has also posed a question, so we'll get to all of those in short order. But Alexander asks, first, what media do you take inspiration for your factions slash races? What kind of tone do you intend to go for? And why are the three races engaged in their struggle with one another in your setting? So uh, I should mention that it seems like the first part of this question uh, was talking about you know, factions and races. I imagine he's just talking about um, CMBW throughout this entire question, but it reads to me like, oh, I'm interested in like, what do you take inspiration for, for uh, your other races, like from the other games and stuff. I would say... As far as the factions in CMBW are concerned, it's just, I first come up with, as part of the rewrite, the setting rewrite that we did for Cresilient, the plan of action was, let's just take everything that's really cool and iconic and thematic and has potential about these races, and let's ditch everything that doesn't work. And what doesn't work about, for example, Zerg is that they have a singular control node, the Overmind, that also has this biblical-inspired personality that directs the swarm through cerebrates, which have also personality that are basically very human. And then also the whole like Kerrigan being an infested Terran, but humanizing the Zerg that were previously kind of unknowable or at least curious. And on top of all of that, usurps the cerebrates and the rest of the control sequence to basically become the replacement to the Overmind, which is just stupid. So Moving away from all of that means that now you don't really have, you're kind of aimless initially because we actually have to flesh out a replacement for that. So we come up with this thing called an organ and you know, the organ is like the replacement for, I guess you could say a brood. I mean, in, in lore, the brood of a Zerg in like default Starcraft lore is supposed to be really big, but then what do you call like, I guess you would call it a hive cluster or something is like the individual players that are belong to a specific brood. But then like in game, the players were the brood. Like if you had two different players, they actually were two different broods. At least that's what it seems like, right? Like two different cerebrates were, were leading them. So the scale is really compressed from the gameplay. And that's what I care more about when deciding what is canon about a game, because the game is telling a story with its gameplay, even if that story is incongruent with the... Uh, with a, the lore that is supposed to happen, like based on a manual or something like the manual can say whatever the fuck it wants. That is secondary to what actually happens in the game. The game always overwrites whatever material are circulating out there around it. And so if you ask me what's canon, at least in Starcraft one, because of course there's retcons of the future. Like, yeah, if, if you're asking me about what's canon about that or what's lore about that, like, yeah, clearly the cerebrates lead very small broods. Like a brood is actually very small. Um, and so the total size of the Zerg is much smaller than they would have you believe based on some other numbers. So anyhow, what we do is individual players uh, uh, worth of forces are organs. And there can be so many organs as part of a very, of a single tendril. Like a tendril, you could imagine that like all of the Zerg you see is a very, uh, throughout the entirety of the original campaign, is a very small fraction of an entire tendril. So the scale that we're operating on is not something we can ever actually deploy within the game, which maybe sounds hypocritical when I was just talking about before, but like that's because in the messaging of the game, we will talk about how ev all of the Zerg you see within Cosmonarchy Brood War missions and etc. are going to be a small fraction of the entire force of that tendril. And that's where you would very rarely see multiple tendrils be necessary. If you wanted Zerg infighting, you don't even need them to be of different tendrils because if you think about it in the context of an immune system, I mean, your immune system regularly fights itself sometimes, or at the very least challenges itself for things like supremacy of resources or like allocation of resources to begin with and what it wants and what it doesn't want. Uh, sometimes you, your immune system will be at odds with itself, especially if you have a, some kind of illness or ailment, which you could imagine could be put on it by another uh, foreign actor, like, a, uh, you know, a Protoss or Terran uh, Armada, or perhaps indeed another tendril. So uh, you, you, if you think about it in terms of like biological warfare that occurs within, you know, your cells and in your body, 
you can apply many similar precepts, or you can at least use that as a lens with which to view the Chrysilient Zerg and how that works a little bit differently. And to say Chrysilient Zerg is also a little bit of a misnomer because the Zerg are all over the place and they simply have been probing at the outskirts of Chrysilient Sector space for a good while now. Uh, so that's sort of how you would think about it in terms of like what they're doing. Zerg are fighting uh, because they... Uh, I'm sort of answering like the question. Uh, there are many questions within this one question, but I will answer the inspiration part and the reason why they're engaged in, in a struggle for each race independently. So we're starting with Zerg, which is just coincidental, but also happens to be Alexander's favorite race. The Zerg are engaged with a struggle for reasons that aren't necessarily telegraphed at any point the actual reason or significance of the Zerg being there where they are uh, and doing what they're doing is seemingly just a quest for resources. But I think over a long enough time scale, especially if I do my, play my cards right with how I present the story and how I you know, sort of show them, I think attentive players who pay, you know, specifically pay attention to like what it means that the Zerg are targeting certain things, uh, I think that will be enough information for attentive players to maybe come up with some explanation for what the Zerg are doing, right? I'm specifically going for vague answers here because the Zerg are meant to be unknowable. That's not to say that I, as the author of the setting, don't know what the Zerg want to do, but to say that, to really explain it and put too fine a point on it is kind of similar, obviously in a different mechanism, but it's very similar to how like, you know, you might have, uh, I think it was Ridley Scott, um, but somebody, you know, say, you know, whoever did Blade Runner, and then they talk about how, like, you know, oh, yeah, obviously the answer is Deckard is a, a fuck, I'm forgetting, a, a, well, a Blade Runner, right? So I, I, Deckard is definitely a, a construct. He's clearly not uh, an actual human. Like, that's kind of stupid, because I thought the whole, like, one of the main interesting points or things you could take away from that movie was the question is unanswered and it's ambiguous and you have to come up with your own theory and that forces you to actually think about that stuff. Like, don't get me wrong, sometimes that mechanism can be really lazy. If it's something super integral, but like without knowing the, like one answer makes the whole story like break and the other answer makes the story work, then yeah, you should actually answer that question. But if one answer does if, if either answer or many answers or whatever that are possible, if all possible answers are instead adding to the value of the story or making the world more rich or not necessarily invalidating the entire world or whatever, that's a point where it actually might be worse to answer that question definitively as the author. And of course, I'm not going to do something like that if I think it's going to make the world feel worse. So I would say that the Zerg it's ambiguous as to why they're really doing it. The most obvious and certainly the tr a true reason why they're doing it is related to resources because you need those resources in order to make an army. So that it's not like that's a lie. That's very much certainly part of it. But is there more? You know, that, that answer to that question is ambiguous. And I think people will be able to figure it out. Like they'll be able to come up with their own answer that makes sense and maybe even have debate between other, you know, I, from a young age, I always thought, wouldn't it be so cool if I had people posting and, you know, uh, back at the day, I didn't, couldn't envision Twitter and, and Reddit and whatever. So I was just thinking of forums, like, you know, the old, uh, star, what was it? Starcraft.org. It was warboards.org for a while, like all those old forums. Right. And I'd go there and I'd be like, oh yeah, I see people posting about how, like, what does this really mean about this game and this lore or whatever? And wouldn't it be so cool if people did that about my stuff too? And yeah, yeah, it would be pretty cool, but uh, you know, obviously not a requirement, just like sort of a childhood fantasy that's left, uh, you know, continued down the, uh, the corridors of my life, you could say. Uh, anyhow, people can come up with their own fan theory and stuff. And like that will be satisfying enough. Like whatever the answer is, as long as it's somewhat sane and grounded in the setting should still work for what the Zerg are doing. Uh, so at the very least, they're certainly going after resources and you can always be grounded within that because even if there is no higher answer or if there is another reason or a couple of ulterior motives, like, okay, well, they still need the resources. So it's not like, again, the answer to yes or no, or, you know, the answers to what, if the, if, if yes, what is it? The answer to those questions are not going to break the story. And that's the important part. They're not going to break the world. Uh, and I'll answer the tone question last. So uh, obviously going to Protoss, uh, the inspiration I had for them was, I really like the whole idea that they can play with things like life after death 
uh, where, uh, I mean, it's not really after death, but they can like save you from certain death initially. And they're, yet their, their honor, their warrior culture is such that they still want to serve the front lines. So they have this whole industry and focal point of a lot of their like infrastructure d dedicated to creating things that work in the context of like, you know, Dracodins and Hierophants and Atreuses and Uptectons, like these sets of units that are striders that are working in the context of like, this is a Protoss warrior. They once were able to pick up, you know, the, the armor and the swords and charge into battle gallantly on the front lines, or perhaps like an Ecclesiast, right? Uh, yeah, the, the sort of lore of the Hierophant is that it was once an Ecclesiast. Uh, it used to be a Cantavis back in the day, but when I changed the voice profile, and uh, I guess if we really wanted to go for that, then we would have to make it so that Mesk voiced to the Hierophant as well. <laughs> but you get the idea. It's like, you know, something like that, right? Could, could make sense, right? Some sort of banneret. And you know, a, a standard bearer, right? Like a flag bearer for the Protoss populace is like, yeah, this is a symbol of their of their race, right? A symbol of their culture is like service even after you've already given service, right? You've literally given health. You've given, you know, they say life and limb, right? You've given limb for the opportunity to give life again. Like, you know, that's pretty, you know, I guess you could say based uh, for as far as the Protoss are concerned, you know, in, in terms of providing uh, value to their people. And, you know, that's just one avenue that I thought was interesting. So, like, in terms of the tech tree design, I obviously reinforced that idea. Uh, martyrdom, right? You could kind of think of it like that. That's what the Archon and the Mind Tyrant are. Um, and then, you know, you go think about, like, okay, what else, what other complex relationships do Protoss have? Well, we already know that, like, the, from the, one of the concepts Blizzard had was this infighting between Dark Templar and High Templar or regular Templar or whatever. And I think that like calling them dark uh, is stupid. Calling them Templar is stupid. I mean, I still technically use that for like the catch-all term for their like frontline warriors, but it's literally a word that's like really rooted in uh, modernity and well, I guess specifically in like old world human history. And then they have words like praetor, which are literally like proper nouns from the Roman times. It's like, why though? Like, why are we using those words to describe you? And then obviously you have fucking Reaver and like Shuttle and shitty names like that. So like, I try to basically, uh, you know, even this this name change, all the name changes that I've done for all the races encompass this, uh, they're encompassed by this sense that there's ideas here that could work, but they need better execution. You need to trim the fat. You need to get rid of all this stuff that doesn't work. And one of the things that definitely doesn't work for me is the idea that we're going to have our naming convention built around the idea that here's a bunch of this stuff with no relation to Protoss lore and instead is related to human history, not even lore of Terrans, but human history. And it's not like these are call signs created by the Terran military. The best you can say is that they're translating it into a language the player can understand, which is, I think the, um, I actually, I'm forgetting, blanking on the, oh, Brandon Sanderson has said before that like, oh, you're in a fantasy setting that has no earth and they, but the character puts their feet up on the Ottoman and the Ottoman is obviously like a reference to the Ottoman empire. And if there's no earth, then there would be no Ottoman empire there. Ergo, you wouldn't call it an Ottoman. And I find that the idea that that's fine, like he actually says that he just thinks of it as translation. Okay, but it's still gonna take the player out. It's still gonna take the reader out of that if they're paying attention. And it certainly does for me. And I can really only you know cater to my own tastes first, right? So based on that, I take a more like, you could say, I certainly aspire to be like the author of the Dune series, Frank Herbert, in this particular respect, where he approaches it like there's going to be some new words that mean something very specific that refer to like a piece of technology. So first, I'm going to describe the piece of technology uh, like by giving it its name and then referring to its name throughout its description and give you this like description for it. And then the first couple of times after that this comes up in the story, I'm going to remind you about it a little bit. Like, yes, the, uh, you know, if there's going to be like an axolotl tank and the... Um, oh, that's not actually, not, I'm confusing that with the animal, but there's like some tank that's like that. I forget the term for it right now, but like that's, you know, say there's going to be a tank like that. And then like this sort of device or whatever, I'm going to name it. I'm going to remind you of some certain aspects of it. I mean, in the case of the tank, it's actually meant to be ambiguous, but this is kind of a bad example for this. But the idea is like, I'm going to remind you what this thing does at the very least. And maybe I'll also remind you what it looks like or some big characteristic of its appearance. And that will help kind of ground it so that eventually like the fifth or sixth time you see this word, you just know about it. Like you learned it. And I think that's a lot better in general. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, not High Templar, Cantavis, not, you know, 
uh, Dark Templar, Kabbalist, right? Like, I mean, Kabbalist actually means something in English. Cantavis is actually like, it's like some ideas of Rudy, like I basically like butchered a bunch of Latin words together, which I, again is still human-esque, but it's not actually Latin. So, uh, you know, the same is true for Lanifect and a Cantor and all this other stuff. It's like, I'm taking these, you know, I have these flowery origins where I'm using a different old world language from humans to come up with the initial words. And maybe that is not as honest as it could be as far as an origin is concerned. But I think overall, like it's an, it's a, an improvement or right? it's a step in the right direction away from naming your shit after like Roman stuff, which just, just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so yeah, that's like one of the things that I definitely did, but you know, they have this complex relationship with some of their more powerful technology. Uh, they're more profane technology. And that obviously is reflected in the new tech trees where in order to train one of their most powerful units, the star sovereign, they have to construct a monument of sin. And that's not going to be true forever because we're going to be revising a lot of the tech tree stuff, but th their relationship with the star sovereign, the reason why the glassing cannon is called the grief of all gods is because to get to the point where they need to deploy such powerful weaponry and thus like basically render the planet that they're glassing devoid of life for a brief period of time uh, and get to the point where they have to take such extreme measures to use such profane things. They view that as a failure for them to even be able to close the, the, the engagement and actually finish the battle before those tools come out. That's a failure in their mind and they will repent for it. And that, that's like, they enter this sort of period of mourning. Like we were inadequate as warriors. We couldn't defeat them honorably. We had to use this profane technology that has, it's profane, not for no reason. It's profane because it subverts a core tenant of Protoss, you know, ideology and culture, this pillar of them that they want to be these sort of caretakers of the universe in some way. They want to, you know, quash these conflicts and, uh, sort of police the the galaxy in some capacity, specifically against Zerg, which obviously are much more just, you could say that they're much more ravenous and all devouring. Uh, and, and, you know, when, when Terrans step ahead of them and become involved, that's obviously a room for them to, uh, to do battle. And, uh, you know, if they're not going to be protected, then they must be, you know, uh, at least pacified. And again, ideally you don't need to glass them just like ideally you don't need to sacrifice the world that Zerg are on with, uh, you know, in intense and profane technology. Uh, and in the same way, you don't need to use Zerg against themselves by controlling them through tyranny or worship. You don't need to, you know, or, or in the same for Terran as well. Like th these are profane things because they subvert like freedom of will, or they subvert protection of life and, and, you know, perseverance of life. Right. Um, they, they subvert these like core tenets of what, what it means to be Protoss and the factions all play into this, right? So like the factions of Zerg are a little bit more like combat specializations because it, right now that's all I've done for them. Of course, it could be a little bit deeper once we get a little bit more into the weeds of like what it means to be Zerg to begin with. But Protoss are a lot more like you can see individuality within them. And so the, the default faction, the divine primacy or the melee tech tree is all of what I just said applies to them. But then there's going to be some spin-offs where it's like the Calendric Knights seek victory no matter the cost. They don't have compunctions nearly as much about deploying at least like some of the more awe-inspiring weapons. Maybe they still look down at you if you're a Kabbalist or if you're a pariah or if you're a, you know, something like that, right? Like a, a Demiurge, right? Like maybe they still think, oh, you probably shouldn't be using that. And then we go to the Order of the Sacred Templar, which as their name implies, they view the like individual significance of a Protoss life to be higher in value than the Terran lives or the Zerg lives. And, you know, maybe the Zerg case is true for the Divine Primacy as well, but they, they like to not view themselves as superior in that sense or as like, Maybe superior, yes, but deserving of, uh, you know, more of life, like deserving of being sanctified more, maybe not, right? Like philosophically speaking, even if their actions in battle actually you know, are at odds with that due to the fact that this, you know, world is very heavily in conflict. And the Order of the Sacred Templar just says, no, use robotics, use these autonomous drones that many think of as borderline profane to even use things like simulacra and vassals use these things because they will be our salvation away from having, uh, you know, so many lost souls, so many, 
you know, fallen warriors. And maybe they would be less likely to use the striders because those would be true death of the Protoss warrior. Whereas, yes, okay, you have a zealot and a legionnaire and whatever. Yes, okay, you have an Ecclesiast, but we can salvage them. We can repair them, restore them to life in some capacity, uh, even if they cannot take to the battlefield again because thus, thus they would truly die. Like that can be some of the undertones of them. And so that's why maybe you would have their faction units, you know, replace that. So I come up with this idea of lore within which they are a riff or a, an idea on the main faction within the, the setting. And that's where like Calendric Knights will use more aggressive options and the Order of the Sacred Templar might have more defensive ones for perseverance of their own units, but also might have less organic units overall in terms of like the design of the, because obviously it has no gameplay impact, but the, that's the design of the, the race in that sense. And you can imagine how that could all work out in practice. So that's the idea of the inspiration for Protoss and like the their things. And I also, in doing so, I pretty much in, talked about why they're in a struggle. They want to protect things. The Zerg seem to want to eat things. And the Terrans are just like, well, we have our own agendas and we're kind of caught between these two ridiculous alien species, but we're still going to do our best. And of course, if we uh, do end up replacing or extending the ice script limit, expect more races to join the fray is what I'll say there. As far as the tone that I intend to go for, there was an example here that I should pull up because there was a little bit more to this question than uh, I actually wrote down in red. But uh, there was, uh, is it going to be the same dark but tongue-in-cheek tone as the original game or something more serious? I think of the original game as, okay, maybe the tone of like the actual game when you're playing and not in the campaigns is more gritty or more like, you know, send a lot of, like lose a lot of men to claim victory kind of thing. Uh, like, if you think about it from the Terran perspective, you're losing a lot of good men to fight Zerg, right? Like, SK Terran, right? It's like losing a lot of good men to fight Zerg, uh, and yet you still do it, right? You, you, you I guess, men and women, because you're losing, uh, you know, more recently Valkyries, but obviously for a long time, medics. And when you're thinking of it in those terms, I think it makes a little bit more sense for some idea of, like, I guess you could think of it like, hey, here's the, uh, you know, this is the tone of the game. It's like how you're playing it, how you're experiencing it. I, th I think there's a lot of value in, in looking at it from that perspective. The campaigns, my man, I'm sorry. I, I did a playthrough of all of the campaigns and I set them down point by point and explained why everything in them is really stupid. <laughs> and like, you know, there's obviously some good things there, but a lot of that is like the longer you get stuck into the game, the more you see the flaws and the more the, like basically the more that these writers explore their ideas, the more it becomes obvious that at least their execution and probably also their ideas are bad <laughs> and lacking. So, you know, you can refer to that playthrough. I'll, if I remember, I'll link it in the description. And you can kind of like look at that and think, okay, well, this is where I'm coming from. Even if you don't agree with my, you know, my, con my uh, what would you say, conclusions, you can still say, oh, at least I understand like where he's coming from, why he doesn't like that. So the campaigns are slapstick, like especially in Brood War, it's all drama and anime. And, and not like, well, when I, also I should note that when I say anime, I, I don't, I, I'm sure there's good anime out there. I watched what, the first season of One Punch Man with Three Crow, Kian. Uh, cool stuff, you know, like funny. It was obviously very much like uh, poking fun at how anime work. But anyway, beyond that, it's just like, I look at that and I think this is, uh, this could be better. This could be better. Uh, most anime is just overly dramatic and unbelievably so. Now, when I'm looking through and I'm thinking like, you know, what tone would I want to strike I think there's going to be, you know, occasional comic relief. There's going to be occasional diffusion of tension through comedy, but it's going to come at an appropriate time. It's not going to be like Marvel movies where they cut undercut every single serious moment with a joke, like make fun of somebody that's with stage four cancer, because that makes a lot of sense in the latest Thor movie or whatever. Like I haven't even seen it, but I've heard enough about it to know that that happens. So that's stupid. Uh, the whole thing is stupid. Uh, I, I definitely take a lot more of like a, a subtle way of my writing. I, I have a script that... I was showing off a little bit a while ago, well before Alexander joined the server, but um, for a, a setting that like, or a mission rather in that I was going to use CMBW to use, it was a slightly altered setting than normal, but it like, there was a lot of things about how that worked that were completely different. Like, 
I think it was like a pilot and a soul and the pilot was like an AI program and the soul was a, an actual Terran commander. And the, so, like, so this one faction had this appropriate, like this, this way of thinking about it or whatever. And so the, the, the soul was like maybe responsible for creative decisions and morale improvements and all this other stuff that like uh, the artificial intelligence wasn't capable of doing. And then the pilot was the one that was actually controlling all the units and like giving them direct orders. But like they, there was this relationship between the two of them that allowed them to, you know, c command such a vast force, despite there not really being much of a chain of command for their faction or something. And I didn't, when I was explaining it to the, the, well, when I was writing the dialogue, it doesn't sit you down and give you a fucking dictionary definition of what these terms actually mean within the setting. You're just expected to pay attention and piece the pieces together. Like you can put the pieces together yourself. The longer that you, you know, have some sort of expectation of like what they're doing or whatever. And you, you get a just experience looking at it. Right. So the tone I intend to go for always, first of all, I mean, this isn't really related to tone, but the presentation respects the player's intelligence and expects you that if, if you want to be invested in the story and you want things to make as much sense as possible and be as um, good as possible or as enjoyable as possible, you need to pay attention. And that also means respecting your time in the terms of the dialogue as well. Like I'm not gonna have really important dialogue events that talk a lot about like really subtle things in the middle of gameplay when you're trying to like macro up or, or, you know, win a fight or something like those are going to be a little bit more to the point and maybe a little bit less subversive or multi-layered. And then when we go into the briefings and the intros and the outros, when things are obviously cool, cooling off, warming up, or you're not even in the game yet, like those are things where I can use a little bit more nuanced writing. And yes, of course, the dialogue options should still have character to them. The dialogue events that are in the middle of the game should still reinforce traits that you already see, but they can be a little bit more about re reinforcing and reestablishing and less about, you know, showing something new or, uh, you know, adding a, another layer to what you had before. Um, even if there is going to be something new, like say you find a fear that a character had or something and they kind of just, they, they blanket statement, say it or something like that. Okay. Well, we'll touch on that later. We'll re we'll revisit that later. And this is just like very quick initial establishing that takes one line. So it's to not distract from whatever else is happening. I'm not even sure if I would do that, but like, if I was going to do that, that would be one of the things that I do. And I think when you limit yourself to a form of dialogue that works within the RTS medium at different points within what is established and accepted as part of the, the way that you would construct an RTS story with briefings, intro, outros, etc. That's going to necessarily allow you to better stick to a tone. Like you pick a tone and you stick to it because now you know what the actual mechanisms for delivering that tone actually are. And you reinforce it through the gameplay as well. So the gameplay should reflect, if, if it's gonna be a funny project, then the gameplay should reflect that. Like maybe you have a birthday map and it's funny because I, I have a bunch of birthday maps that are funny. And like the enemy does some meme strategy, like trying to proxy contain you with, with anchors or something. And like, but you could also present that in a way that is serious too, if you just change some dials around or whatever. So like it's either way, like the gameplay should reflect that. But as far as like the tone that's explicit within the dialogue and the design of like the, the factions and et cetera, I don't want to be overly grim and macabre, but I mean, this is war and this is like galactic war and intergalactic war. It's like gigantic amounts of forces being pitted against each other. You're seeing massacres in the, you know, millions and billions and trillions. And like, you know, eventually you're going to get to really crazy, like in lore, this is what's happening all around you. Maybe not necessarily in the moment when you're playing. Cause again, we can't get to the true scale of like trillions of agents of Zerg. Like you can't get trillions of units in the game. <laughs> There's like hardware limitations on that. Uh, even if you turn them all into one pixel size polygons, you still can't get that many because of all the computations you need to run for each unit. So like, there's no way you can do that, at least currently, nor do I, and I'm not so sure that it would actually be good anyway, even if you could achieve that insane mind boggling scale. But what I do know for sure is that the the tone should be serious, grounded, like not taking you out of it not immersion breaking, like the tone should be a little bit more on the gritty and, t and serious side. But again, not overly dark and to the point where there's no hope or there's no, everything's super bleak. Like these people are fighting for something. The Terrans are fighting for something. The Protoss have a noble goal, even if they're maybe always failing to let, you know, I guess measure up to the task or something. Uh, and then obviously the Zerg, I mean, they're apocalyptic and they're unknowable, but that doesn't mean that they're like, you know, they have to be super uh, ridiculous about how they approach things or, or whatever. So what I'm getting at here anyway is I definitely think that the tone is very obvious with what I'm doing. 
Uh, anyway, that was the first question, and that only took like 20 minutes, so. Uh, let's talk about the second question. And this is a little bit more specific, so we'll be able to answer this a little bit faster. Are the, all the Terran factions varying totalitarian states like in vanilla StarCraft lore? What are their various philosophical underpinnings? And then he asks a second question, which is, I noticed the Protoss have some pretty evil looking units later in the tech tree. What are the reasons for them tolerating or even embracing this? Well, it's kind of, I'll answer the second question first because it's a little bit faster. I already mentioned that the profane tech, for whatever reason it's profane, uh, where it subverts some cultural underpinning of what the uh, Protoss are. That is a case where it's like, they need this to like ensure that they stay alive and don't f lose all military engagements that go longer than a certain amount of time even if they view them as failures. And then there's going to be some factions that don't view them as failures and instead is more tolerant towards them. Uh, obviously there's like the Starbound or whatever, which are like, they're just survival Protoss. They are surviving whatever way they can. And th yeah, they will use whatever cheap trick necessary to defeat you. They're, they're the DFs of the world, spamming Anthelians into your worker line. <laughs> That's what they are. So like stuff like that, assuming they can get up to that level of power, of course, which is maybe a little bit harder for them. Um, so yeah, they, they, the embracing thing happens with sub factions, the toleration happens with, or the tolerance or whatever Th that happens with, uh, with the divine primacy and two different branches of profane tech with the other sub factions. Like, I don't think that the order of the sacred Templar are too comfortable nuking worlds with star sovereigns necessarily. So they would just tolerate it and certainly be, uh, regretful, but they're much more tolerant of things like demiurges and, the empresses and stuff uh, currently are robotic units and et cetera. So that's going to be a little bit better for them to uh, understand and tolerate because they view that as an aversion to like, they are avoiding needless loss of Protoss life. And so you can think of it like that. Whereas the Kalendric Knights, they're going to be a little bit, they're still going to be intolerant to profane things like mind control, but they will be more accepting and embracing of raw power like the Star Sovereign. So hopefully that explains that. As far as the Terran factions, are they varying totalitarian states? I didn't really think too deeply about political systems when I was drafting the factions. Insofar as like you have the Futurist Federation and stuff, like my faction names are more accurate. The, like the Confederacy is not actually a confederacy. You know what I mean? It's not a confederation or whatever. So that's like one example of like StarCraft One lore is just the factions are called that because they sound epic and not because they're actually and I use epic in air quotes in here. They sound cool. They have the rule of cool, but they don't actually make any sense when you think about what a confederacy actually is. Uh, whereas like the coalition, the Hikaton coalition is, uh, yeah, they're a coalition because they got fucking booted out of their home system. And this is all that remains. Like they used to be a much more powerful nation. Uh, and now they're just like the, the scraps you could say, uh, which is still a very powerful and large nation relative to other Terran nations. But not to, you know, own up to the Orion Imperium or whatever. And Imperium makes a lot of sense when you consider how vastly powerful the Orion Imperium actually is. That applies. Federation does apply. Um, and then, you know, you think about, like, the the other nations as well. Uh, the Golden Republic. Yes, it, it is a republic, like, in the classical sense, right? And then you think of uh, the Nidus Trinity isn't really related. Like, what is a trinity? Like, in this context, right? It's not really a nation in that sense, but they're also not conventional Terrans. You could, <laughs> you could say that much. As far as um, what their philosophical underpinnings are, like Terrans in general, they like to explore and they also like to lay claim. And that's pretty universal. Um, the, re the reasons for them doing it might be different. The Golden Republic want to ascend to become as you know good as Protoss, right? They're like xenophilic for, towards Protoss. And then obviously the Nidus Trinity are xenophilic towards Zerg. And there's like interesting sort of rifts there. Um, particularly since what, what that says about Terran, like the Starbound are not interested in forging alliances with Terran or taking control of Zerg organs or whatever, but they will do it if they have to. Uh, but certainly Zerg themselves are not interested in the other races unless they think they can get something out of the, the partnership. And the Protoss are also not interested in the other races by and large. They're more interested in safeguarding the Terrans and, you know, stopping the Zerg from, like, they don't even, they don't want to exterminate all Zerg, I should mention. They just want the Zerg to live in their own area instead of continuing to threaten life in their Protoss systems as well as uh, in the Terran system. So that's sort of like what provides them with all of this, this conflict, right? All this fodder for conflict. Meanwhile, uh, the Terrans, yeah, they, the reasons for them wanting to stake their claim in new space and continue to expand their borders is, you know, the reasons may differ, but the net result is kind of the same where they're very much like 
this is how we rule, this is how we expand our borders and et cetera. Um, obviously world building is important. I'm very, I'm a big guy who like, as far as like trying to make sure that all of the agents make sense within the world, like their actions make sense and their motivations are consistent. Like that's very important to me. So I would say, I look at that and I say like, yeah, currently we check out, but we're also not really super deep into exploring those. Um, one of the upcoming Terran campaigns, Day of Blood, does r explore worlds or the life under the Imperium, basically, and like why a revolution may take place uh, and also how that might take place logistically. And I, th I have constructed a reason for all of those events that in my view does not make it seem like the Imperium is just a bunch of jagoffs that can't do anything, which is what the Confederation was, the Confederacy in, in Star Stock Starcraft, as well as the Dominion in Starcraft too. Like all of that stuff is just junk and none of it makes any sense. It's like, how would you possibly have this like uprising of Sons of Korhal for the Starcraft one, if you're a serious nation. Like I understand you're under attack by Zerg, but they just didn't do the work to present the Confederacy straining under that weight. They just like lock you down. They tell you to lock down and never move and they don't evacuate and they expect you to do nothing about it. Like their, their actions are stupid. And the same is true for a lot of Starcraft one and two, uh, like factions or whatever. Uh, basically in Starcraft two, especially whoever you are not playing as is just such an idiot. Like every faction that you're not you're personifying yourself is just so moronic. And usually your faction is also moronic, but maybe to a lesser degree or not as frequently. Um, that, that is something that I definitely don't want to be the case. Like I want both players or all players involved, all like factions involved to be making correct decisions. And then the player wins by making good decisions in battle and outsmarting or outmaneuvering their opponent and overwhelming them that way, as opposed to the player wins canonically in terms of their faction, as well as maybe in game, just by the AI and the enemies being dumb in lore or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that's not satisfying. So I would just say we'll explore the philosophical parts, maybe a, a, to some degree in the game, in, in the future campaigns and stuff. But I am just not interested in basically creating something where the enemies are dumb and that's how you win in terms of like the lore of it is like they make stupid decisions. Like that's really dumb to me. So you'll just see that be very different when you actually play the campaigns when they're actually playable and done. All right, we've uh, arrived at Luciferius's question, which is the final question of the segment. Luciferius just simply asks, how's your mental health? And I gotta say, I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm, I might be a little bit, uh, I, I was a little bit, you know, burnt out and tired uh, after the very long day that we had on Saturday, but that's more transient and much more like physical almost as opposed to, you know, oh, I'm really uh, like not feeling well mentally or whatever. Um, I'm also a fairly private person, so I don't usually talk about any stresses that are happening in my life or uh, mention too much about like something that's going badly. Uh, and I, w I will say like, just like anybody's life, it's not all sunshine and roses. Like there are gonna be some things that are negative or even about really positive things, there are gonna be some things that are negative. But I gotta say that overall things are going really well. Um, you know, I guess without saying too much, I've uh, recently met somebody who I'm getting serious with romantically. So uh, that's always, heartening, uh, quite literally in many respects. So her and I are uh, hitting it off and things are going well in that department. And then beyond that, uh, obviously we, we got this tournament, we got this bigger focus, we got, we're casting a wider net, we got, you know, more people interested who have found out about the project. And that's all very, I would say cathartic, you know, it's a, we, we've, we've worked on this for years. Some people in the community have really pitched in a lot. Uh, I've obviously, this is like my brainchild in many ways. And it serves as a hypothesis or like a mission statement of like, this is what we think the RTS can turn into. And this is why it's better. And like, just look at the result. I don't need to go on to podcasts and talk about how wrong everybody else is or how much better things could be if I can just point to this. And so getting it to the point where it's actually like that is super cathartic and I'm very happy. And yeah, you know, on a numerous occasions, I've just felt, I've also looked at the community and like looked at what we've built and like the conversations that we have on the Discord server and all that stuff. And I thought to myself, you know, I didn't, I'm not solely responsible for this. Nobody is solely responsible. It's obviously literally a community. So it's a communal effort, but also I had a significant hand in building this community. And that's something I can really feel good about. So yeah, you can, you can say I'm pretty happy and I don't see a reason why I would, you know, barring some, uh, you know, tragic, sudden circumstance or whatever, I can't really imagine things going downhill quickly at all. So hopefully everything continues that way 
And as I basically, as long as, as long as the status quo holds up around me, as far as like finances and like inflation doesn't continue getting ridiculous. And, you know, I keep all the jobs that I got and all that stuff. Right. Like as long as that happens, you know, as long as there's nothing massively changes in that department. Yeah. Things are going to be great for a very long time. And I can't really see why they would ever get worse. <laughs> I mean, I can see how it could happen and I'm prepared to, you know, do stuff if it, if it does, but things are just really nice right now. So yeah, that's my answer to that. And of course, uh, the customary, how are you doing? Hope you're doing well. That sort of thing. So it goes out to everybody, not just Luciferius, but since he asked, I got to mention him specifically. And that is it. That's the end of Prototype, ending on a very wholesome and fun note. Uh, number 15 will be out probably same time next week or something around there, uh, depending on my schedule, of course, at work. Like I said, I'll be averaging these once a week. Come up with a question, answer or ask it, and I, it will be answered. And that's assuming you are one of the members of the coffee. And if you're not, and you want to be, well, follow the link, hand us the money. We appreciate it. We put it to good use. In fact, the, the more money we end up getting, the less work I and Veek have to do, ergo, presumably, anyway, for Veek, but definitely for me, the more time that can be spent on stuff like Cosmonarchy Brew War, Antikythera, the engine that we're building our other RTS games in, which admittedly has been a little bit slow going recently, but that's because Veek is adjusting and adapting to his new schedule with his work. So... We'll have more episodes of Crow's Nest over on the No Frauds Club YouTube channel eventually. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get more actual uh, ideas. I do want to, again, shout out Dark and Fantasies. Since Vika has step, taken a step back, DF has taken a step forward. Uh, X45 came back. We, I, I don't remember if I talked about this in the last episode of Prototype, but he's back looking at maybe improving the campaign UI and making that more sensible, as well as obviously investigating iScript. I got to check in with him after this. I just remembered. Uh, Solstice is still working on model stuff. So yeah, we're the collaborators are collaborating and I do want to shout them all out. Uh, even shout out Vik, obviously, even though he's but he recently stepped in and gave us automatic versioning that stops you from joining a game that is the wrong version. And that's really cool. So I'm pretty happy about that. And it's something we've needed for a long time. So as long as I remember to actually build different plugins for pre-release versus release, we should be good. Uh, and that's going to be really exciting. So yeah, I guess with that said, uh, that's going to conclude this episode of Prototype. And I'll catch you guys in a week for another one and much sooner for other videos, streams, etc.